The last speaker of this session is uh, Chris Fuster from the University of York, uh, titled Asymptotic Measurement Schemes for All Observables of AQFT. Thank you very much, Yorma, and it's uh, thank you to the organizers, and I also have to apologize for not being able to be here so much this week. Um, so I'm going to talk on the subject Yorma mentioned. Uh, this is uh, a continuation of a research program that I started with Rainer Fersch and continued with Henning Bostelmann and Maximilian Ruff. And the talk today is based on a preprint with Ian Job and Maximilian. Um, so let's get on with it. Um, I'm going to start by giving you a lightning review of locally covariant measurement schemes. This is what I've been doing for a little while. The basic aim here is to measure local observables of one quantum field theory, which we'll call the system. And uh, it's going to be on a globally hyperbolic space time, which I'll call M, and it will have an algebra of observables, which we'll call A. And the way we do it is by invoking a probe, which is also going to be a quantum field theory. And this one will have algebra of observables B, and it will live on the same space time. We're going to couple them together in some compact region K. And this, of course, because we've changed the dynamics, gives us a new quantum field theory, naturally enough, C. Now, this is going to be all done in a very abstract way. I'm not going to uh, tie this to specific models at this stage. But the dynamics of the coupling can be encoded in uh, something that can be described as a scattering map, theta. And this is on the tensor product of our system and our probe theories. OK, so we have this coupling defined somehow abstractly and it can be encoded in a scattering map. At early times, we prepare the probe in a certain state, which will be called sigma. And at late times, we're going to measure observables of the probe. And the upshot of this is that we can find a map from probe observables to system observables. This is going to be called epsilon sub sigma. And uh, the definition of this has the following property. If you take a probe observable, B, and you feed it into this map, you now have a system observable. If you take the expectation value of that system observable in state omega, then, well, here's the formula, but what you need to know is that it equals the expected outcome of measuring B in the coupled system, which we prepared in state omega tensor sigma at early times. OK, so this is the result of an actual measurement you might conduct on the couple system in the laboratory. Uh, and uh, this uh, uh, system observable here is a sort of faked up observable that gives you the right expectation values. OK, so this is how we map from probe observables to system observables by equality of expectation values. So here's the second strike of the lightning review. Uh, these induced observables can be localized, and they can actually be localized in any region containing the coupling. That's where they live, more or less. We can use the framework to derive state update rules for selective or indeed non-selective measurements of the probe. And I note the word derived here. These update rules are completely compatible with causality. So the impossible measurements that Raphael Sorkin uh, raised uh, many, many years ago do not occur in this framework. Anything that can be measured in this way is free of impossible measurements. It's also important to say here that the state update appears as a bookkeeping exercise. We don't talk about collapse of the wave function, or at least we don't need to talk about it. And this is useful because it removes some very awkward questions about where state reduction uh, might actually occur. And most important is that one can calculate explicitly using this framework, at least in specific models. So that's what's been known before. What I want to talk about today is how comprehensive is this scheme? So can you actually measure all or essentially all local observables using this framework? If so, then we've really got rid of the impossible measurement problem. But it could be that there may be observables that are decent ones in the theory that can't be measured in this way, in which case, Maybe there are some impossible observables left after all. So this is what we're investigating. Here in the first instance is a proof of principle, um, which I hope will convince you that one expects to be able to measure everything. 
So I'm going to consider a system and a probe, they're real Klein-Gordon fields of equal mass. And as we know, we can put two such fields together as a complex field. So that's another way of describing the two together, uncoupled. And for the coupled version, I'm going to consider a complex Klein-Gordon field with an external vector potential. And it's a pure gauge form. Chi is just a scalar field. And it's even vanishing to the future of one Cauchy surface. And it takes another constant value, pi by 2, to the past of another one. And because the vector potential is the gradient of this chi, it vanishes here and here. So the coupling is only switched on in between the two Cauchy surfaces. So here and here, the coupled and uncoupled versions agree. Now, of course, what we know is that you can map between uh, the uh, uncoupled uh, equation and the coupled one simply by multiplying by a complex phase. And that's because I used a pure gauge uh, vector potential here. So this is a nice trick, but it has the consequence that this scattering map I told you about, if it acts on uh, an identity from this system and a smeared probe field from the uh, probe theory, uh, it just maps us to the system field smeared against F, the same one we had here, tensor the identity, it just switches things around. And that's obviously to do with this pi by two in the uh, external, uh, in, in this chi. Um, and in fact, uh, this can be uh, used to show that the induced observable corresponding to this probe observable is the system field. And all that seems to have changed is the label as whether we were talking about a probe field or a system field. This extends to linear combinations of powers, which is everything you've got in the theory. And so we have the conclusion that every system observable can be measured. And to do that, to work out what probe observable you need, you simply write down your system observable as a product of smeared fields, and you change all of the S's to P's, and you've got it. Okay, so that's the proof of principle that all local system observables can be measured. Now, I'm not quite happy with this because although this is really easy uh, and straightforward and done in a page, uh, it's a bit of a cheat. Uh, that's because we have this non-compact coupling region. And even if we had a compact coupling region, it's not really in the spirit of the framework of locally covariant measurements. So I'm not totally happy with it, even though I came up with it, um, but it does give us some hope that the general problem might be solvable. So uh, moving on, um, what can we do instead that's absolutely in the spirit of the, uh, of the locally covariant uh, measurement scheme? Well, uh, one idea is that it's enough to make a measurements up to arbitrary accuracy. So let's consider a system uh, S, and it'll give it a topology, suppose it's got one, and some probe theories, some preparation states, and induced observable maps corresponding to these. So there's a coupling between the system and the probe theory living inside here. So these map from uh, the alpha th probe theory to the system theory. And if it should happen that we can find probe observables B alpha so that we have the convergence of the induced observables, um, I'm not even going to pronounce it, converging to alpha in our system theory, then we say that this whole collection of things gives us an asymptotic measurement scheme or AMS for our system observable A, okay? Because we have this uh, set of observables uh, converging. That means that uh, in expectation value, we will get agreement uh, in the limit. Okay, so that's the idea. So the question is, can we find at least asymptotic measurement schemes for all local observables? little bit to say before that, uh, we'll call this a Hermitian AMS if all of these probe observables are Hermitian. And that's only possible if our uh, observable A is Hermitian as well. So some properties. If we have two local observables, each having AMSs with the same probe theories and couplings, but obviously different uh, probe observables, then we can form linear combinations of these probe observables. And of course, we get an asymptotic measurement scheme for the linear combination of the observables. That's the first thing. And the second thing is if we've got a, an asymptotic measurement scheme for A, we can just take the star of all of these uh, operators B alpha, and that will give us an asymptotic measurement scheme for A star. 
putting it together, if we have a Hermitian operator A with an AMS, then we can, of course, just form this obvious trivial combination here and get a Hermitian AMS. So importantly, any observable that has an AMS has a Hermitian AMS. OK, so now we need to look and see if we can do this for scalar fields. I'm going to consider a system field and a probe field. They're both scalars. Um, the field equations are going to be linear, uh, normally hyperbolic operators. Simplest example being Klein-Gordon, but you can throw in potentials and what have you. So here's a field equation for the system field. There's the uh, field equation for the probe field. Or we can write it in a matrix form where we double up the fields to form a, a, a two component field phi. Our coupled version of this theory, uh, we're going to throw in an off diagonal term, lambda r. And uh, r is just going to multiply by a smooth, compactly supported function living in the cou coupling region. OK, so this is going to be our coupled system, system and probe coupled together. The nice thing is that such systems actually do have advanced and retarded green operators. And I'll put, call those E plus and minus sub lambda. Uh, in fact, even for complex values of lambda, and uh, it's even analytic in lambda with respect to a suitable topology that I will not bore you with just now. Um, but uh, the uncoupled system, of course, can be recovered simply by putting lambda equals zero. So we have a good classical uh, theory um, of coupled uh, fields and nice green operators. Well, we can also try to understand this measurement scheme business uh, at the classical level. And at the classical level, uh, the theories can be described by symplectic spaces, which are uh, actually realized as quotients of the uh, test functions on our space time, quotiented by things that are S acting on test function. OK, so uh, what does all of that mean? Well, the equivalence class of F in this, uh, in this symplectic space is actually a linear observable where we take a solution to the theory integrated against our f over the, uh, excuse me, over space time. And because we're working with uh, solutions, it doesn't matter which element in this equivalence class we use. So that's a classical theory. Um, we can use the probe to measure the system field, just as we were talking about in the quantum field theory. And there's an induced observable map. And if we take a, an h defining some um, classical observable at late times, it gets mapped to a system observable. And the formula uh, for the F that goes in here is given in this way here, a little bit complicated. There's the uh, H that defined our probe observable. Here is the advanced green operator for this coupled system. There is our R operator, there's lambda again, and there's the test function. So that gives us two things. We only need the F at the moment, but G will turn up uh, in a little bit. So that's the classical theory. Um, our idea to get an asymptotic measurement scheme is simple. We replace h by h sub lambda, which is just h divided by lambda. That's really neat because the h divided by lambda, the lambda will cancel this lambda. So that's gone away. And we know what happens when lambda goes towards zero because we know this thing is analytic in lambda. So it's actually easy enough to see that the induced classical observables from H lambda actually converges to a specific test function here. This is a system observable, which can be written in this way, in terms of the uh, H, the uh, advanced minus retarded for the uh, probe theory, and our compactly supported function rho. And then what we need to do is sort of reverse engineer H and rho so that we get our desired system observable by this formula here. And then we have an AMS. And the theorem is this can be done, OK? And uh, that's in the paper. Uh, I, it takes quite a while to do, but uh, it is all doable. Excuse me. So some remarks. An interesting fact here is that the test functions we use are diverging as lambda goes to 0. So we can sort of ascribe an effort to these uh, just by taking any semi-norm or, any, if you like, any measurement of the size of one of these test functions 
uh, which we'll call F for effort. Um, and then obviously the uh, effort associated with this thing uh, is going as one over lambda as, uh, and therefore going to infinity as lambda goes to zero. Meantime, the difference between uh, the uh, classical observable we're inducing and where we want to be is actually equal to, well, something bounded divided by the square of the effort. So what we discover is that reward requires effort, probably something you were told by a teacher and disliked then, but it's true, unfortunately. So because we have the second power here, uh, we call it a second order asymptotic measurement scheme. We can actually get asymptotic measurement schemes of higher order uh, by throwing in more probe fields. And we can also uh, use this same trick of using more probe fields to form linear combinations of AMSs, if you like, uh, to find uh, AMSs for linear combinations of our test functions. So that's the classical theory. You may have heard a slogan and either understood it or disliked it or what have you, that is second quantization is a functor. In this case, it means that we have an easy route from the classical to the quantum theory. Let's suppose we quantize both the system and the probe and this coupled combination as before. The quantum induced observable map it turns out is given in this way here. So here's the quantum induced observable map. I'm finding it easiest to use exponentiated fields. Okay, so there's a probe field smeared with H, exponentiate it, stick it into this quantum induced map. And what do you know? It's actually equal to the, an exponentiated system map where the system field gets smeared by the classically induced uh, test function. Okay, coming from the classical system. But there is a factor in front. I told you G would turn up and there it is. And there's our probe preparation state. Okay, so this is a formula that was known from my paper with Reinhard Fersch a couple, few years ago now. Uh, if you use the Weyl algebra where you actually have exponentiated fields, and this is exact, if you like the algebra of smeared fields, you can just think of this as an equation for generating functions. Uh, either will, will, be, uh, will be workable. But what we're doing now, we're going to rearrange it a little bit. Remember, we want to know how to get a specific exponentiated system field. Um, well, um, we know how to get F as a classical limit. Okay, that was the previous bit. So we can write this as the limit of these expressions and we just rearrange. Uh, and we get uh, we have to take the sigma factor down onto the other side. So this gives us the uh, exponentiated fields. If you're working with smeared fields, then you differentiate with respect to our parameter x. And by again combining probes, we can get arbitrary polynomials in the smeared field. So that gives us everything that we want to know about. So um, there are some topology. I said uh, that there is some at the back of this. I'm not sure how much I want to detail I want to give you here, except to say that there are natural topologies on the field algebra, and uh, it works in that scheme. There is a natural topology on the Weyl algebra, which is not actually the norm topology, the C star norm, norm topology, which is notoriously bad, but there is another one uh, which is actually uh, well, strong star topology and GNS representations, I do know what that means or you don't. Um, and then this asymptotic measurement scheme works in that topology. And finally, the von Neumann algebra you get by closing the uh, Weyl algebra in suitable Hilbert space representations. Again, we have convergence. So we can work in any three of these um, conventional descriptions of the free scalar field and everything comes out nicely. So I'm coming to the last uh, topic in this, uh, which is the physical interpretation of our scheme. So it's interesting that we uh, simultaneously turn down the coupling because lambda is going to zero, and we turn up, if you like, the detector sensitivity because our test function is getting bigger. So uh, we're asking, uh, if you like, uh, for a, a bigger observable to be me measured. Our notion of effort for the quantum 
case is going to be based on the covariance uh, measure. This is a convenient way of measuring the size of an element in, in the uh, algebra. And uh, if you use this method, then you can see that what I've described is a second order scheme. Okay, so the effort um, is scaling like one over lambda squared as uh, lambda is going to zero. Please so, have five minutes. Five minutes is great. Um, so what you might wonder is why I have focused on the fact that the uh, test functions are getting bigger and not on the fact that the coupling is getting smaller because you might think that's getting harder and that's getting easier. So why am I focusing on one of them? Well, um, let's reflect on the fact that this asymptotic measurement scheme is giving an increasingly good approximation in the expectation values uh, of our uh, desired system observable as lambda goes to zero. And there's our order lambda squared again. Of course, we could try to measure this probe observable just by measuring this probe field here and dividing the result by lambda. So we can use the same physical device, if you like. If you've got a 5 pH meter, you just use that and process the data. So there's no extra work involved in that. And you might again wonder where the effort is. The problem is that the variance of this observable, these induced observables, is actually diverging as lambda goes to zero. So if we only make one measurement, a single measurement of this, we get in some ways a less accurate approximation to what we want. Okay, statistical fluctuations are high. Well, we can compensate for that, as you all know, by repeating the experiment and averaging. So this is my notation for this averaged repeated thing. The variance, when you work it out, takes this form here, A and B are constants. Uh, we have N, number of repetitions, lambda coupling strength squared. Uh, and then this term here doesn't depend on the number of repetitions. So to maintain accuracy, we need N to grow like one over lambda squared. So that will, will give us accuracy, the same accuracy, um, but of course requires increasing resources, the number of repetitions. And the theorem that we proved is that um, the interval from this averaged value of n repetitions at coupling lambda plus or minus epsilon, this is a confidence interval for what we're aiming for at this confidence here, there's delta parameter, whoops, parameterizing it, provided that the number of repetitions um, is given by this, well, approximately by this formula here. Here we see the effort that I was referring to before. Here is the confidence parameter and there is the width of the confidence interval. So unsurprisingly, you need more if you want those to be small. And so our abstract effort measure is manifested in the resource budget. So it genuinely is uh, a measure of the effort you have to put in to get desired precision. So I come to the conclusions. Um, it was already known that the locally covariant measurement scheme is consistent with causality. And what I've shown here, at least in one model, is that this is a comprehensive framework for measurement as well. All local observables can be measured, at least asymptotically, using local schemes. You have to be careful how you design the experiment. That doesn't sound so surprising. And in our case, uh, the slogan is to tread lightly and carry a big stick because we are turning down the coupling and increasing the size of these test functions. And finally, the abstract effort measure that I was discussing is tied to experimental resources needed for the measurement. And uh, with that, I will conclude and thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. We have some time for questions. Please uh, raise a hand. I'm not seeing a hand at the moment, so let me abuse my position here. What, uh, I'll come to fate in a moment. Uh, what's wrong uh, with the C star topology? Oh, well, if you take the norm difference of any two vial elements, so at any two exponentiated fields, 
then the norm difference is two, unless you chose the same uh, field twice. So you can never actually get two, a sequence of vial elements converging to another one unless it was a constant sequence, all right, in that norm topology. So it's an absolutely terrible topology. Um, and so for phys anything physical, you need to do something else. And, and typically what people do is go to representations and then use the Hilbert space topology to, uh, to uh, get a better, more physical notion. And the physicality comes from the sort of representations that you use. Thank you. Uh, Faye. Hi, Chris. Thank you. Okay. Great, great talk as always. Um, so the scheme is designed to um, give you the expectation value of the observable of the system field. Um, so the, uh, this is, like a, I don't know what sort of more philosophical somehow question I and mean, then the usual quantum rules you know just the textbook ones for quantum mechanics uh, there's more than just the expectation value isn't I mean that it the rules tell you what you will get if you just do one measurement you know that it's one one eigenvalue of the of the operator corresponding to the observable and of course, if you don't do, you know, if you don't do many measurements, then you can't deduce, you can't deduce the um, expected value and you can't deduce the, anything about this, you know, the state, the, the coefficients of the various components of the, of the, um, of the eigenvectors in the state. But, it, but nevertheless, it's, it's some information. I mean, it's some, it, it, it's a prediction of sorts. It's not the full prediction, but it is a prediction of sorts. You know, it's not the Born rule prediction, but it's something. So is there anything like that? Or can one address that question? Okay, so well, that, actually there are several aspects to that. One is right. that um, uh, you, you talked about getting a single eigenvalue. And um, I think I would imagine taking projectors, okay corresponding to is the result in a certain range that would be a more typical sort of thing that you would find so yeah uh, given I mean any experiment you have you would probably only ever be able to measure down to some granularity and and the value of your you know some maximum value uh, so there are only going to be finitely many of these things that you need to measure in one go um, so in some ways I think that one can adapt this scheme to get at the useful information that would be, if you like, encoded in an abstract self adjoint operator uh, that we would have. Actually, we have a coarse graining forced on us by, by uh, physical concerns. And so I would use one of these schemes to make finitely measure many measurements of that. In terms of the statistical aspect, I think I would point at these, this sort of analysis that we went into to what it what happens if you repeat n times okay as you reduce the sensitivity so you, you get closer to the expectation value but also the i mean if we increased n faster than one over lambda squared then we could even squeeze the um squeeze the variance in and, and you'd even uh, reduce the statistical fluctuations as you were getting a better uh, better approximation to the target okay so so i think uh, i i think your question sort of has several different aspects, but I think we've got them covered uh, okay. one way or another. All right, thank you. But the, just to clarify, this repeating n times is to get closer to the. Uh, uh, so each time, each time you're getting something, you're getting, you know, a value which is. <laughs> Which is the expectation value, so to speak, yeah. but but with some variance. It's not you're, like yeah, you're making yeah. a measurement of a random variable whose expectation value is the thing you want. Okay, yeah. and so you know you've right, right. got statistical fluctuations, and so right. um, in some ways it's not great to say, well, look, your random variable and my random variable have the same expectation value. 
because we could get be getting very wildly different actual sure. results yes, when we sir. sample. But this sort of analysis shows that I, I have the variance uh, of the of those statistical, uh, if you like, the measurement run statistics under control while we're uh, making one of these measurement schemes. Okay. All right. Thanks, Chris. Thank you. Let us thank Chris again. Thank you very much.